when something is lost, whether at home or in the office or wherever, it seems that we find it in the most unlikely place. Like, like the time my husband Bruce, who is even more of a piler than I am, was looking for a very important document. He went through all the piles on his desk and in various other places in the house. And then he went through my piles. Now, this might have taken a while, and it did. Trust me on this one. But he couldn't find what he was looking for anywhere until it showed up in the most unlikely place of all, properly marked and alphabetically filed. As I said, when something is lost, we find it in the most unlikely places. Perhaps the same is true when someone is lost. This morning's scripture is a very familiar story of Zacchaeus, and it ends with these words, the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. But who's lost in this story? The traditional understanding is that Zacchaeus is lost, but let's not jump too quickly to this conclusion because you see, there is another way to view this story and it fits with Jesus' tendency to take what we think we know and to turn it on its head. Those of us who grew up in Sunday school know this story, or at least we think we do. Jesus enters the town of Jericho. His face is still firmly set on Jerusalem. He's he's still healing, still preaching good news to the poor, still challenging the status quo of cultural and religious practices and beliefs, and still drawing wildly diverse crowds that include Jews and Greeks, outcasts and poor, rich and powerful. Crowds filled with believers and doubters, critics and curious, and the grateful and the grumblers. Zacchaeus was among the crowd that day. As we know, Zacchaeus was a tax collector, and tax collectors in Jesus' day were assumed to be unpatriotic, dishonest, and unclean unpatriotic because they work for Rome, that foreign occupier whose oppressive rule made life for the Jews quite hard. Dishonest because the taxation system allowed tax collectors to keep anything they collected that was over and above the fixed rate that Rome required of them. And ritually unclean, not welcome in the synagogues because tax collectors are in regular contact with Gentiles and the unclean coins that unclean Gentiles touched. Zacchaeus was not only a tax collector, but the scripture says specifically he was rich. He had figured out how to work the system to his own economic benefit. He had people working under him and giving him a portion of whatever they could take in from those who who they were taxing, those who had little recourse to challenge the unfair but perfectly legal system of taxation. Luke, in describing Jesus as both a tax collector and a rich man is giving us a bit of a mixed message here because you see, on the one hand, tax collectors are considered by Luke and in scripture outcast and sinners, yet Jesus considers them welcome and accepts them, much to the chagrin of most people. On the other hand, the rich are considered by most to be blessed, yet Jesus speaks most harshly against the rich. So he accepts the outcasts and sinners. Jesus speaks against the rich, calling them things like fools, 
saying, woe is you who are rich, teaching them that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter have, be saved. And so Zacchaeus, who, whose vocation makes him shunned and whose wealth makes him suspect, can't win until, as we were taught, until Jesus sees him, calls him by name, goes to his house, until Zacchaeus, in the act of breaking bread with Jesus, has a change of heart, which leads to a change of behavior, which leads him to receive the promise of salvation from Jesus, who has come to seek and save the lost. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. I once was lost, but now I'm found. That would have been a perfect song for Zacchaeus, right? Well, maybe not. Like I said a minute ago, let's not jump so quickly to the conclusion that Zacchaeus is the one who is lost. Because there is another way to interpret this story, another way to understand who's lost. And verse 8 holds the clue to who might be lost. You might even take a look at it. The crowd is grumbling because Jesus is focusing his attention on Zacchaeus, for whom they have great disdain. They know he's a sinner. But as they begin to grumble, Zacchaeus practically cuts them off and defends himself to Jesus and says, look, Jesus, I give half my money to the poor. And if I've cheated someone, I repay them four times. They need to quit grumbling. Right there, under that tree, surrounded by people who have made false judgments about him, Zacchaeus finds the courage to speak up for himself. Now notice that Zacchaeus is speaking about something that he does, not something that he will do at some point in the future. It has already been Zacchaeus' practices to give away half his money, which is far more than the Jewish law requires. It has been and still is his practice to make right his mistakes. Now, in Luke's original Greek language, the original language this scripture is written in, it is important, and this is important, Zacchaeus speaks in present tense about what he is doing, not about what he will do. And unfortunately, some translations have put the Greek into future tense and have Zacchaeus saying in response to his encounter with Jesus, I, I will give to the poor. But a more accurate translation of the Greek tells us otherwise, tells us that Zacchaeus is already doing good things with his wealth, already doing what his faith asks of him. So you see, Zacchaeus doesn't sound lost after all. In fact, it sounds as if he's been living up to his name, Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, which means righteous one. So, if Zacchaeus isn't lost, then, then who is? Well, first of all, it's his Jewish neighbors, the folks in the crowd who are lost. They're lost in their self-righteousness. They're lost in their preconceived notions of who's good, who's bad, who's doing what. They're lost in their judgmental certainty that Zacchaeus is a sinner, a horrible man. The poor in the crowd look at his wealth and assume that he's hoarding it, failing to live up to the biblical mandates of caring for the poor. The rich in the crowd judge him as a traitor of the Jews because, that, who doesn't deserve his wealth because of the way it was acquired by colluding with the Romans. The religious in the crowd deem him unclean for dealing with dirty people and dirty money. 
And Jesus' followers assume that he can't possibly be considered a disciple because he's rich. It doesn't occur to anyone in that crowd to assume that Zacchaeus is righteous. But Jesus, Jesus knows better. As a matter of fact, Luke's Jesus in particular has always been pretty good at finding righteous people among the unlikely. Think about it. Jesus lifts up the faith of a Roman soldier as praiseworthy. Jesus celebrates the actions of the good Samaritan. He praises a Samaritan leper who was the only one who gives thanks for his healing. And he commends a tax collector for being more righteous than a sanctimonious Pharisee. It is totally within Luke's pattern to cast, Jesus, cast Zacchaeus as the righteous one and those in the crowd as lost. It's totally within Luke's pattern to portray Jesus as challenging the holier-than-thou attitude of the crowd and calling out those self-righteous grumblers who think of themselves as being good, law-abiding, God-fearing Jews. They've all but demonized Zacchaeus and turned this into a us versus them, or, or better yet, us versus him situation. But Jesus, by ignoring the conventional wisdom of the crowd, makes it clear that you can be doing all the right stuff of faith, that you, you can be living the right way, have the right beliefs, and still be lost. Because in your self-righteousness, you've turned inward. In your self-righteousness, you've imagined that it's all about me and what I'm doing. In your self-righteousness, you've, you've turned toward yourself and away from God. And in the Bible, such self-centeredness is the epitome of being lost. So Jesus turns the tables on the crowd. Jesus makes it clear that this is not a us versus them situation, not a us versus him situation. He says, putting his arm around Zacchaeus, we're all children of Abraham. And Jesus, by inviting Zacchaeus, himself to Zacchaeus' house, is going out of his way to say that Jesus, that Zacchaeus, is one of us. He's challenging the lost crowd to see that this rich tax collector is one of them. And to see that each other as related, to see him and them and all of them as intimately connected to one another, all children of God. So who's lost here? The crowd, yes, but also the church, church with a capital C, because it has fallen into the same trap that the crowd fell into, assuming that it is Zacchaeus who is lost. Unfortunately, for centuries, the church has interpreted, or should I say misinterpreted, this passage to bolster their misguided understanding of what it means to be saved. Again, the traditional understanding of this passage sees Zacchaeus as the lost sinner who Jesus honors, which prompts repentance, which leads to forgiveness, which leads to a change Zacchaeus' behavior, which ends in Jesus proclaiming salvation. As if salvation is the reward for changing your ways and doing good works. As if we can follow a prescribed formula in order to achieve our own salvation. You connect with Jesus, check. Change your ways, check. Do the right thing, check. You're saved, check. But that's not the way it works. 
not according to Jesus anyway. You see, for Jesus, Zacchaeus and his family had always been included in God's plan for the salvation of the world. Because Zacchaeus, like everyone else in that crowd, is a child of God, or as I like to say, a child, a child of Abraham, or as I like to say, a child of God. Zacchaeus is one of us because there are no thems, period. Truth be told, Zacchaeus is living a far more righteous and honorable life than anyone except Jesus is giving him credit for. If anyone needs to repent of anything, it's the church that needs to repent of its works righteousness when it comes to understanding salvation. As the old hymn goes, softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, not to Zacchaeus though, but to the church to come home. So who's lost here? The crowd, yes. The church, yes. And maybe it's us. Because if we're really being honest with ourselves, we have to admit that all too often we are like that smug crowd who has such contempt for the Zacchaeuses in this world. In the church I was called to serve straight out of seminary, there was an older couple who, but, but most folks held this couple at arm's length and hesitated to interact with them because frankly they were nothing like most of the folks at this church. You see, they were rich, and I mean really, really, really rich, and everyone knew this fact and didn't know how to act around them or, or engage them. I was filled in early on when one of my parishioners, whose husband had just been laid off from his assembly line job at the factory owned by this couple, told me with some disdain, and I quote verbatim, you know that couple? They're capitalist snobs whose wealth was inherited. Don't mess with them, Helen. Another church member, a woman who talked like she knew everything about everybody, and we know who folks like that are, don't we? She told me about all about, didn't hesitate to tell me all about this couple and their lavish lifestyle and their over-the-top building projects, and how they wielded so much power in this city. Helen, she said, you need to get in good with them. <laughs> so I gotta tell you, during my first several months with that church, I heard a lot of gossip and a lot of grumbling about this infamous couple who came to church nearly every Sunday, sat quietly in the pews, and then went home. But what I did not become aware of until later was that this couple was generous to a fault with their money and their minds. That they were giving away millions in support of the community and the global church and the local church and young seminarians. What most folks don't know is that every time there was a death in that church, this couple anonymously made a substantial, and I mean substantial, memorial gift to the church. What most folks didn't know was that this couple offered quiet behind-the-scenes, grace-filled leadership that thwarted the efforts of a faction that was attempting to pull the church away from its disciples' heritage. What most folks didn't know is, is that this couple was thrilled when someone finally got up enough nerve to ask them if they could send a caroling group to carol to them in their home. All this from a couple whom 
people assumed wrongly were aloof and cared only for themselves and their own bottom dollar. Now, in fact, you may have heard of this couple. If you know anything about Christian Theological Seminary or Cummins Engine, you'll recognize the names, Xenia and J. Irwin Miller. We humans are awfully good at making wrong assumptions about other people, aren't we? Maybe the other is someone who, like Zacchaeus or like the Millers, is rich beyond our imaginations, and, and like that crowd in Jericho, we make all sorts of self-righteous judgments about them. Maybe the other is someone of another political persuasion who we feel has betrayed the core of our nation, our values, like that crowd in Zacchaeus who thought he had betrayed them. And we smugly wonder, how could Jesus accept someone like them? But here's the thing. And this is good news for the crowd, which means it's good news for us. Jesus stays with that crowd, lost as it is, not writing them off, always healing and teaching, always seeking to engage them and love them. Jesus remains with that crowd even when, especially when, it is made up of gossipers and gawkers and doubters and disdainers and sinners and cynics, even when, especially when, it is the, if the crowd is made up of good, ordinary, imperfect, judgmental folks like you and like me. Jesus doesn't abandon the crowd, which means he doesn't abandon us, even when they abandon and reject him, he continues to stay with them, continues to see them as the precious children of God as they are, and never gives up hope that they will someday see themselves and each other in the same way. Jesus stays with them, even when they pass false judgment against him and mock and scorn him and shout out, kill him. And lost as they are, Jesus forgives them, remembers them, and promises paradise for them, even in his dying breath. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Friends, may today our giving be a response.